Hello and welcome to the seventh seminar. Today I just wanted to give you a short introduction to technetium. All right, um, so I'm going to talk a bit about some basics about technetium as an element, technetium inside of nuclear reactors, technetium from spent nuclear fuel, the production for medicine as it differs from the reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel and technetium in different oxidation states to give you some technetium chemistry. All right, so uh, technetium is, to be honest, just another element. It's element number 43. It's a group seven element. It's below manganese and above rhenium and even further above borium, but no one cares about borium. Uh, it's the lowest atomic number radio element. A technetium isotope is not the lightest radio isotope. This award goes to tritium, but technetium is the one with the lowest atomic number, which has no stable isotopes. There's another exception. This is the promethium. All of the other radio radioactive elements are quite heavier, don't have any stable isotopes, but yeah, technetium is quite special in that regard. You can explain the non-existence of stable isotopes by Matthaus rule, which states that there are no stable isobaric neighbors and for some reason molybdenum and ruthenium both have quite a huge variety when it comes to stable isotopes, so there is just no place for technetium. Of course, this is a very ad hoc explanation, but it gets the job done at the beginning. Since there are no stable technetium isotopes, technetium can be produced artificially. There is some naturally occurring technetium, but most of the technetium that we have on Earth is produced artificially by nuclear processes, for example, nuclear fission or neutron irradiation, for example, for molybdenum. But I will get to that in the next slide or the slide after that. All right, these are the most long-lived technetium isotopes. It's technetium 97, 98, and 99. The technetium 99 is the most prominent one as it's produced the most, even though it's not the longest lived one, with a half-life of 210,000 years. This is what real technetium metal looks like. This is yeah, technetium metal, electrodeposited, on copper metal. Uh, looks quite shiny, but to be honest, it just looks like a normal metal. Nothing special. It's quite active one, but nothing where the dose rate would completely fry you. All right. Um, I talked about it being produced in nuclear processes. For example, nuclear fission. What you have here is the cumulative fission yield. And as you can see, 6.1% is quite a high number. So the technetium 99 will be produced in quite large quantities. Technetium is among the lighter fission products. So, so if you look at the mass distribution of your fission products, when you do nuclear fission with uranium-235, you can see that there are some masses that will be produced in higher quantities. And this is around the mass of 100 and 140. So on the heavier branch, you have the cesium-137, the iodine, the xenon um, fission products that we all know. And on the lighter branch, you have isotopes like the zirconium-95, the strontium-90, and of course, the technetium. Uh, technetium-99 is produced in quite high quantities. As you can see, it's produced about 2 grams per day per 100 megawatt hours. And there are about 2,200 tons available, which correlates to a production of 30 tons per year of technetium. Of course, I don't want to say that we have 2,200 tons of technetium metal just lying around waiting for it to be used for chemistry. This is more mostly in spent nuclear fuel and yeah, you could get it out, but if you want to get it out, if it's economically feasible, this is another question, it's, it's not, but yeah. If we wanted to get all of the technetium for chemistry, we could get around 2,200 tons of technetium. Yeah, but how do you get it out of the nuclear reactor? This is done via the Purex process. So plutonium uranium recovery by extraction. First of all, you start around here. You have your spent nuclear fuel rods. They will um, be cut by a very big hydraulic scissor and then drop into hot nitric acid. The hot nitric acid will dissolve pretty much everything. So in this hot goo of nitric acid, you will have uranium that is not burned down. You have plutonium, you have all the other actinides and transuranic elements. You have your fission products, so really nasty stuff. And what you then do is you add 30% tributyl phosphate and 70% of kerosene to it. And this mixture will be able to separate out the uranyl and the plutonium ions by forming a complex that looks something like this. This is not the real TBP as 
TBP stands for tributyl phosphate, but it's normally the tributyl phosphate. In this case, we have the structure of tributyl phosphate, but I couldn't find the other one. So as you can see here, we have the urinal complex with the uranium atom in the middle, the two oxygen from the urine ion, then you have two nitrate ions here, and then you have the TBP molecule, and this will be dissolved into the kerosene. Everything else will stay in the aqueous solution. Oh, aqueous solution, it's hot nitric acid. Now, this is what it looks like on a lab scale. So you have this yellow phase, as you can see here, they can be separated out quite easily with the urinal ions. And in this case, we just have water, but on an industrial scale, you will have the nitrates of your fission products. So here you have the technetium. Yeah? Since everything will stay in this aqueous phase, you can just separate them out. And since today we are going to talk about technetium, uh, we will focus on this phase. Yeah, <laughs> what you then do is a whole lot of chemistry. <laughs> just if you want to read it out, uh, PPT is the short form for precipitation. So you do evaporation and then zirconium and niobium as they are not that soluble will fall out of solution as a precipitate and all of that. And then you do a scavenger precipitation and a whole lot more. And then after all of this chemistry, you end up with hopefully at least 99.99% pure ammonium pertechnetate. It has to be at least this pure because of season 137 impurities. Since season 137 has a half-life that is one ten thousandth the half-life of technetium, if it wasn't at least 99.99% pure, the activity of your sample will be dominated by season 137 and not the technetium. So it has to be at least this pure. Now you know how to get at least somewhat pure technetium out of spent nuclear fuel. This is stuff that we have in our lab, but this is not how you get the technetium for medicine. And because this is all of the long-lived technetium isotopes. So you get the technetium 97, 98 and 99 and other junk as season 137 impurities. So this is very impure when you go into medicine. This is completely useless as we do not want these isotopes. We want a special isomer of technetium 99, the technetium 99M, which you can't get out via this process. This is why you do another route in order to get to technetium for medicine. So you have to irradiate molybdenum with neutrons. So you have the um, molybdenum 98, then you do neutron irradiation to molybdenum 99, which is a beta minus emitter, and then it decays into technetium 99M, which is really important. The technetium 99M is what we want, right? This is uh, stuff that you do in the reactor. This is the stuff that you ship out to hospitals and then they can milk this molybdenum cow, which always decays into technetium 99M. So this is the decay scheme. I will go further into detail in hopefully another presentation. And I just wanted to show you that the molybdenum 99 decays 82% of the time into this technetium 99 isomer. This is the technetium 99M. This is what everybody wants to get their hands on with 35 million procedures a year, which correlates to about one technetium application every two seconds worldwide, which is absolutely insane. And this decays via an isomeric transition, emitting a 143 kilo electron volt gamma line into the technetium 99M ground state. And this is what you use for medicine in order to get this image done if you measure this one. If you do this, this is the stable one with a half-life of 210,000 years. You won't get an image because this does not emit noticeable gamma lines. So you need to have this one in order for it to decay and then release this gamma quantum that you can then measure. So there's the technetium 99M that you use for medicine. This is what you get out of spent nuclear fuel. Okay, um, so a brief introduction to technetium chemistry. The technetium chemistry, it's quite similar to manganese and rhenium, arguably more similar to rhenium, but I will state the argument that most of you only know manganese chemistry, as you might know the potassium permanganate solution from high school, which is this lilac pinkish solution. Yeah, and the technetium is quite similar to it. It has two oxidation states that are very stable, the technetium in the oxidation state plus seven, so with no electrons, and the technetium plus four, which is three electrons. And yeah, the technetium plus seven is similar to the manganese in the oxidation state plus seven, you know, the permanganate ion, and the homolog to it would then be called the pertechnetite ion. This is very highly mobile, it is really water soluble. This is what it looks like. And it's really pain in the butt when you want to talk about final repository as it sticks to pretty much every surface. So this is what you really have to be careful with that it doesn't get out of your container. You also have the technetium in the oxidation state plus four. So this is the technetium dioxide. Its solubility in water is 
small, which is similar to the manganese dioxide. It's really not that so water soluble, but since this is radioactive, this is something to keep an eye on, so not to neglect. But of course, technetium can also stabilize other oxidation states, similar with manganese. You also have the technetium plus five. This is not that stable in aqueous solution. Uh, it's also quite interesting, but it has to be stabilized by organic ligands. Uh, not something that is really difficult, but yeah, it's a bit more difficult than just throwing it in water. All right. And the interesting part about technetium is that it's um, an element that can stabilize various oxidation states. So plus seven, plus six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, and even minus one oxidation states are known. So the technetium chemistry can be quite colorful. And I just wanted to show you a picture I found on Wikipedia from all of various technetium compounds. Yeah, so technetium chemistry can be quite colorful as most of you probably didn't expect because I don't think most of you have seen technetium chemistry like at all being done. But it will be done on the YouTube channel in the far future. With that being said, goodbye.